I'm going to continue today on uh, the introduction to crystallography and in the last lecture I explained that there are basically seven crystal classes. So for example, we have the cubic class in which we have the cubic P, the primitive, the cubic I which is the body centered and the cubic F which is the uh, face centered cube. And similarly, uh, in, in others we have you know, the orthorhombic C and the orthorhombic P and so forth. So within uh, a crystal class, we have a certain symmetry, which is the minimum defining symmetry. Okay? And in the case of the cube, I explained that there are four triads, which are the body diagonals. So here, here are the four body diagonals of the cube. Uh, so this one, this one, this one, and this one. 111 type directions. And if you look at the corner, that's a threefold axis. That means you rotate by 120 degrees and you reproduce the whole uh, of the um, atomic arrangement or lattice points. Yeah? So the minimum defining symmetry for a cube is that you must have four triads. If you cannot find four triads when you're looking at the shape of a crystal, it cannot be a cube. And similarly, the other crystal classes are defined by the other symmetry elements that we have. So if I go back here, you know, we've got a, a monad for the least symmetry. This is a triclinic crystal where none of the lattice parameters are equal and uh, all of the angles are not 90 degrees or equal to each other. In the case of a hexagonal lattice, it's obvious that you must have at least one axis which has a six-fold uh, rotation symmetry. Yeah? So everyone happy with the definition of a crystal class? Crystal class is defined by a certain minimum symmetry that must be present. Yeah? OK, um, I'll go back now to the two-dimensional lattices. And how many two-dimensional lattices do we have? Five. Uh, this is uh, an obvious one. It is the primitive square. Uh, can you think of others? Other shapes? So here the lattice parameters are equal and the angles are 90 degrees. Uh, yes, that's right. So we have two kinds of rectangles. This is the primitive rectangular lattice. So there's only one lattice point per cell because these are located at the corner and they are shared between four other uh, between three other rectangles. So it's one, two, three, four divided by four, so one lattice point per cell, and that means it's primitive. And here we have also a centering lattice point. So this is the rectangular C lattice. So we've got three, and there are two left. What, what others can you imagine? Remember that a unit cell must fill all space when you stack. Oblique. Yeah, oblique. So in the case of oblique, these two uh, edges will be inclined at some angle, which is not a specific angle. Okay? And the final one? Hexagon, where that angle is uh, 120 degrees. So here, this is the hexagonal P lattice, where this angle is 120 degrees, and these edges are equal in length. And this is the oblique, where the angle and the length, uh, the angle is not necessarily 120 degrees and the lengths are not necessarily equal. Okay? Now, can you, can you tell me of a two-dimensional crystal which has been making big news? Graphene, exactly. So graphene is basically a hexagonal array of carbon atoms, uh, a layer of carbon atoms in a hexagonal arrangement. If you fold it up and you zip it up, you create what? Carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube. Okay. So this is a cylindrical crystal. Uh, it's hard to imagine a cylindrical crystal, but in the very last lecture in this course, you'll see that there are actually cylindrical shape uh, crystals in which the atoms are in cylinders and they operate according to many of the rules of crystallography. 
So two-dimensional crystals are also important, but in general, we are dealing mostly with three-dimensional arrangements of lattice points. So let me just summarize what we've learned so far. You know that there is a clear distinction now between an amorphous material and a crystalline material. The amorphous material has isotropic properties because there's no long-range periodicity in the structure. And crystals have long-range order. That means you can define the origin at any lattice point, and it'll look exactly the same around that lattice point. And of course, it will be anisotropic because the distances between atoms and various other things will change according to the direction in which you are looking. Uh, crystals, of course, can be solids or they can be liquids. You saw uh, cigar-shaped molecules arranged in a certain order, and that gives you the liquid crystals, which are common in liquid crystal displays. Uh, they can be of arbitrary shape. That means you can make a turbine blade out of it, you can make a, a silicon lump of silicon for semiconductors. But if you give them a long enough time, then they will tend to become faceted because that is the equilibrium shape. Yeah. But the equilibrium shape takes a very long time to evolve in general. Uh, we are not just interested in single crystals. We are also interested in polycrystalline materials where we have boundaries between crystals. Okay. And those boundaries are defects, which we will treat in some more detail later on. Uh, a lattice is defined by lattice points, and the lattice point has the same environment around it wherever you uh, locate it. And you define a unit cell, another imaginary concept, because there's an infinite number, a number of ways of defining a unit cell. You know, if I have a square pattern, then the obvious way is to draw a square unit cell. But there's nothing to stop me from defining this as the unit cell. So there's an infinite choice of unit cells, but we try to use uh, something which reflects the symmetry of the pattern, short lattice vectors, and angles 90 degrees if possible. Okay? So, so that's how we define unit cells. And the condition is that they must fill space. They mustn't leave holes. Um, we looked at the, uh, sorry, a primitive cell is a cell with just one lattice point per cell, and a lattice vector is a vector which starts at a lattice point and ends at a lattice point, okay? not, not halfway or, or quarter way or whatever. Bravais lattices, 14 uh, objects in three dimensions which represent long range periodicity, and out of those 14 lattices, they fall into seven crystal classes, and each class has a defining symmetry. For example, the four triads for a cube, and we learned how to index directions and planes. And the Miller indices of directions are straightforward. They are just the vectors and their components with respect to the basis vectors define the Miller indices. With planes, we did something strange. We looked at the intercept of the plane with the axes and took the reciprocal of that. Okay. I haven't explained to you why that why we do that, but we'll come to that later on when we deal with a reciprocal lattice. Now, so far, everything we've done is imaginary. If you look inside the material, there aren't axes and angles marked and so forth. We've now got to create a structure from that lattice. And crystal structure means that you now place something on each of the lattice points. And that's something that you place must be identical because you know, the environment around the lattice point must be exactly the same wherever the lattice point is. So here, for example, is a structure projection along the z-axis of a primitive unit cell, cubic unit cell. I'm now going to place an atom at a, a cluster of atoms. So let's imagine this is a copper atom and this is a zinc atom. I've placed a pair of atoms at this lattice point. Therefore, I've got to place a pair of atoms here, there, and there. Okay. Every lattice point must be treated exactly identically. Right? 
So if this is a copper atom and this is a zinc atom, then we've created the crystal structure of brass, copper zinc alloy. Okay? Uh, so the way we created it was we took a lattice, which is a primitive cubic lattice. Okay? We added a motif. A motif is an object, you know, like, like a bee or a flower. In this case, it's a motif of two atoms, a copper atom at zero, 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 and a zinc atom at a half, half, half. So the motif consists of a copper atom at zero, 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 and a zinc atom at a half, half, half. And that gives us the crystal structure. So this is now real. You're actually talking about atoms now. Now, what kind of a structure is this by looking at it? Sorry? Body-centered cubic? Think again, yeah. Yeah, because this is not the same as this, okay? when we come to doing um, diffraction, if this was body-centered cubic, you would not get diffraction from the faces. You would not get a one zero zero reflection because the plane of atoms halfway would be exactly halfway out of wavelength out of phase, so you do not get a one zero zero reflection. But these atoms are different. Therefore, you will get a 1, 0, 0 reflection. It will be weak because it depends on the difference in the scattering factors of the copper and zinc atoms. Okay? So be very careful. Yeah? If the environment is not the same, so this is surrounded by four copper atoms and this is surrounded by four zinc atoms. So clearly the environment here is not the same as the environment here. So this is a primitive cubic structure, not a body-centered cubic. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Uh, re just to remind you, the atoms which are not labeled are located at heights 0 and 1. Okay. Now, this is a fairly simple structure, but you could have a very complicated motif here. It doesn't matter. If I, if I have 10 atoms here and I place them at each lattice point, it's still cubic P. All you need to know is what are the coordinates of the atoms that you put at each lattice point. Okay. So this, this is the three-dimensional version of what I was showing you. Uh, the atom in the body center is different from the atom at the corners. As I go through various examples, you'll see that it becomes pointless to draw these three-dimensional representations because they just get too complicated. Okay? So stick to structure projections. Okay, so the basic formula to generate a real structure, that means a real arrangement of atoms, is that you start with one of the 14 lattices, you choose a motif which must be exactly the same at every lattice point, and that generates the structure. So we have a primitive cubic lattice with a motif of copper at zero, 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 and zinc at half, half, half. Okay? Okay, uh, now we are going to do the structure of diamond. Uh, that means the diamond that we wear on rings or, or wherever. Yeah? Uh, diamond has a lattice which is face-centered cubic. So this is just a projection of the lattice. These are not atoms. Yeah? So we've got uh, lattice points at 0 and 1, here, 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 and here. And we've got lattice points on the centers of the vertical faces. So this is a projection along Z. Everyone happy with this as the projection of cubic F? Now diamond is generated by placing this motif at every single lattice point. So a carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and another one at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Okay? And I've got to do that for all of the lattice points. So yeah, that's the first 
first motif, an atom at zero, carbon atom at zero, 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 and a carbon atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So I'm going to go next for the lattice point located at a half. So I should generate another carbon atom here at what height? Three quarters, because we are starting from a height half. Yeah? Oops. Yeah. OK, so if we start from a height half, then obviously this one would come at three quarters, right? And we do this for every single lattice point. And if you focus on this square, you can see that we've generated the structure of diamond. So there's a, a carbon atom at a quarter and a quarter, because these are at 0 and 0. There's a carbon atom at a half and 3 quarters and half and 3 quarters. How many carbon atoms are there in the unit cell? You, you should not look at the picture. You should be able to tell immediately. How many? How many lattice points in cubic F? Yeah? Four. Multiply by the number of atoms in the motif. Eight. Yeah? Because um, these ones at the corners represent one carbon atom. Okay? The ones at the faces represent th uh, three, because we have six faces, so that's four. And then we have four totally enclosed by the unit cell, so that's eight. So there are eight carbon atoms inside the unit cell of diamond. Let me show you now what this looks like in three dimensions. And if you had to draw this, you would be in trouble. Yeah, so here you go. This is the structure of diamond. And the interesting thing is, of course, they are all tetrahedrally bonded. Okay? And these are very strong covalent bonds. And that is why diamond is extremely hard, because you can more or less not move dislocations which are present in diamond. Okay? Now, you can actually see this tetrahedral coordination in, in this as well, in this diagram. So tetrahedron means you know, you've got bonds at going out from the center symmetrically in diagonal directions. So here, for example, is an atom at 3 quarters. Then there will be an atom at 1 and 1. In other words, you've got that bond. Right? And then if you look in this direction, this is at 3 quarters and these are at half and half, so the bond is going downwards. So you've got four bonds, two pointing upwards and two downwards. So here is a tetrahedral. Uh, co uh, this, at this atom is coordinated by a tetrahedron, just as you saw in the 3D representation here. Yeah? Okay. So once you, once you get to visualize the 2D projections, it's much easier. You can see the coordination around each atom and draw the structures very easily, uh, define what is a lattice vector in that structure and what is not a lattice vector. So for example, um, let me ask you a question. Is this a lattice vector going from here to here? Yeah, because this is a lattice point at 0, and this is a lattice point at 0. How about this? It's not. It's not a lattice vector. So if you had a dislocation move with a Burgers vector, which is that, you would create a fault. Yeah? That wouldn't reproduce the crystal structure. So we call those dislocations a partial dislocation. When it moves, it changes the stacking of the planes. So when you look at austenite in a transmission electron microscope, you see stacking faults, don't you? Those stacking faults are created by a dislocation moving through, which has a Burgers vector that is not a lattice vector. Because the definition of ordinary deformation is that when you have a slip dislocation going through, nothing has changed. You've only produced deformation. The crystal structure remains identical, but that can only happen if the Burgers vector is a lattice vector. Yeah, everyone happy with that? OK, so that's the diamond crystal structure. Uh, we are going to make things a little bit more complicated. Um, 
this is again the uh, diamond structure, but instead of placing a carbon atom at 0, 0, 0, and another carbon atom at a quarter, 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 we now have a motif which is zinc at 0, 0, 0, and sulfur at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So these atoms are now different. The atoms in the motif are different. And this is exactly the zinc sulfide structure. Now, if you think about light emitting diodes, yeah, what is the latest material that people are working on? What, what are light emitting diodes made out of? And how was the breakthrough obtained in getting different colors? Yeah, light emitting diodes have been around for a long time, but not, for example, blue or green and so forth. So how, what is the material that makes light emitting diodes? It's not zinc sulfide, okay, in case you're thinking that. <laughs> mm. So again, I remind you, yeah, this is Korea. The biggest producer of electronic devices uh, gallium nitride, okay? And if you add a third, you, you had it right, right? You have to have courage to speak up. You know? <laughs> uh, if you add a third element to it, you can change the band gap. So that means you can control the color of the light. And gallium nitride is exactly this structure, but with gallium and nitrogen instead of zinc and sulfur. Okay? So this has made uh, cycling very inexpensive because the light, uh, the batteries last for a very long time if they are made out of uh, these diodes. So this is the zinc sulfide structure in three dimensions. And here we have the gallium nitride structure. You can see gallium atoms at zero, 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 and uh, the nitrogen atoms at the other position. Now, Fluorite has three atoms per, uh, per lattice point in the cubic F lattice. So this is the cubic F lattice and we've placed, so can somebody tell me what is the motif here? It's cubic F, right? So, but what is the motif? So calcium fluoride is CaF2. That means there are two fluorine atoms and one calcium atom. Oops, what's happened there? Okay. Yeah, go, go ahead. So I want to know what is the motif that we place at each lattice point? Okay, so it's almost right, yeah? Because we have, we have twice as many fluorine atoms as calcium, yeah? So, you know, we, we've got all these inside the cube. That means they count totally towards fluorine, yeah? So we've got a calcium atom at zero, zero, zero. So that will give us four calcium atoms because it's a cubic F lattice. And we've got two fluorine atoms, one at a height quarter and one at a height three quarters, and there are eight of those inside the unit cell. So CaF2, okay? So the motif is basically calcium at zero, 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 and fluorine at a height quarters and three quarters. And this is the, the structure that you see. So, you know, you have these eight fluorine atoms totally inside the unit cell and we have four calcium atoms on the lattice points at zero, zero, zero and at the face centers. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So it's very simple if you think in terms of this formula that the structure is given by the lattice combined with a motif placed at every single Lattice point. Okay. Okay. Now I uh, pointed out to you 
that uh, we make single crystal turbine blades here, yeah? so that we eliminate all the grain boundaries, and therefore uh, we do not get uh, a path for easy diffusion inside the boundaries, and we make a creep resistant material. And I explained to you how these single crystals are made, and I'm just going to show you a movie. So you start solidification from the bottom and there are thousands of crystals nucleated and they're growing in a temperature gradient and only one of them actually makes it through that spiral. Okay? And that's what gives you a, I don't know why it's moved to the next movie, but let's go back to this. See, I was told not to use my laptop because this is being recorded. And we missed the recording of the last lecture because I used my laptop. But did you see how one crystal made it through the spiral? Yeah? And that's how you make the single crystal turbine blade. Very beautiful invention. Just put the right sort of spiral with the right number of turns, and you get single crystal solidification as you pull the mold out of the um, temperature gradient. So I've actually seen these being made routinely, you know, so that a factory full of machines which will make these by the dozen. Okay, um, so that's the turbine blade in real life and its length is approximately this big because as you get towards the really hot part of the engine the pressures are very high and the blades are, are smaller and smaller. Okay. So this is the critical part which operates in an, in an environment which is at 1400 degrees centigrade but the blade melting temperature is below 1400. Okay. Now that is amazing, isn't it? How do you do that? There's no material reasonable material that we can use which will operate unprotected at 1400 degrees C under the stresses and the rotations and so forth. What you do is two things. There's a coating on it which is made out of ceramic and that acts as an insulator. So there's a large temperature gradient across that and then you pass cooling air through the blade and the cooling air is at a temperature of about 600 degrees centigrade. So the total blade is maintained at a temperature of about 1,000 degrees centigrade. Okay? And you know, this is uh, the thickness of the wall there is it's very, very thin, you know, of the order of one and a half millimeters. And yet you have really complex cooling channels going through this. So this actually, in my opinion, is a much more advanced technology than electronics. Yeah? Electronics don't work very often. This has to work totally reliably in an aircraft engine. Yeah? How many times are you annoyed with your mobile phone or with your computer, right? You can't afford to have you know, system crashes or anything like that, you know, like the random movie appearing when I didn't ask for it to appear. So people don't realize, you know, that the sort of things that you will be doing are actually uh, safety critical. People's lives depend on that, yeah? So you should feel very happy you're studying this subject, yeah? Now, I said to you that's a single crystal, right? But if you look at its structure inside a transmission electron microscope, it looks like that. That clearly isn't a single crystal. There's almost 70% of precipitates in it. These are, these are precipitates and this is the remaining matrix. So why do we call this a single crystal? It doesn't make sense. Now we, we need this to be extremely creep resistant. And the precipitates are there to stop deformation. But if we have precipitates and this 70% of the space is occupied by precipitates, then how can this be a single crystal? 
Well, these are extremely clever precipitates, extremely clever. And that's illustrated over here. So let's imagine that the composition is only uh, nickel and aluminum, right? It's actually much more complex than that, but we have only nickel and aluminum. And the average composition is given by Ni3Al, OK? And let's assume that the aluminum and nickel atoms are randomly located on the lattice points. In other words, there's no order in the location of aluminum or nickel. So here is the unit cell. And this could be an aluminum atom or a nickel atom, but the composition is that. So what is the structure here? What's the unit cell? Hmm? Sorry? We've got, we've got these at the face centers, haven't we? Yeah, cubic F. All, all these are identical, really, because they are random. They're not really identical, because it knows whether it's aluminum or nickel. But they are dispersed randomly on a long range. And therefore, if you take uh, a diffraction pattern, this will be exactly a cubic F lattice. Okay. Now, we order the atoms. Uh, so remember, we've got Ni3Al. So the nickel atoms must be located at the face centers, because that gives us three nickel atoms. And the aluminum atoms at the corners. What is the unit cell? Primitive. Now it's primitive, yeah? because the environment here is not the same as the environment here. It's primitive cubic, and this is cubic F. And the difference in lattice parameters between these two is very small. Okay? So they are coherent. When they touch each other, uh, they are in a cube-cube orientation relationship. All right? So there's a cube, cube, cube orientation. So what that means is that the 1, 0, 0 of gamma, which is the disordered phase, okay, disordered, is parallel to the 1, 0, 0 of gamma prime, which is the ordered phase. And 0, 1, 0 of gamma is parallel to 0, 1, 0 of gamma prime. So the cubes are exactly aligned to each other. They have almost the same lattice parameter. And that is why we think of this as a single crystal. Yeah. Now, is there any advantage in having lattice parameters almost identical? Remember what we are using this for? We are using this for creep resistance at very high temperatures over long periods of time. What happens if you have precipitates, which are held at a high temperature for a long period of time? So if I, if I have uh, bubbles, right, and I look at them, how will they be changing? Yeah, they will coarsen. That means small bubbles will disappear and large ones will grow. And why, is, why does that happen? Yeah, the total surface energy decreases if you have a few large bubbles and almost none of the small bubbles, right? So it's totally driven by interfacial energy. If the interfacial energy is large, then the coarsening rate is large. Interfacial energy is reduced if the two crystals are matching, right? So it's a wonderful system. We have a huge amount of precipitates with a coherent interface, and therefore it's stable almost stable at high temperatures. Okay. Right. Now, the disadvantage of coherency is that it's easy for dislocations to go across the boundary. Right. So we normally add precipitates to steels to stop dislocations. Right. So we've lost that advantage. So how does this material 
how do the precipitates strengthen the nickel alloy? Well, it's very clever. So these are the unit cells again. And this is the cubic F. Is this a lattice vector? Yeah? And that is a lattice vector which is A by 2, 1, 1, 0. Okay? A is the lattice parameter, and it's A by 2, 1, 1, 0. How about from here to here? Is that a lattice vector? No. For the gamma prime, the lattice vector is A, 1, 1, 0. Okay? So this is for gamma. And for gamma prime, it's uh, A into 1, 1, 0. In other words, if a dislocation from the gamma tried to enter gamma prime, it would have difficulty because it's not going to, uh, as it moves through the gamma prime, it will create a fault. So it has to do a lot more work to get into the gamma prime, and that's called order hardening. Order hardening. Because the lattice vector is twice the size. What that means is that the dislocations from the matrix have to move in pairs. A110 and another A110 following it. And that is exactly what you see in a transmission electron microscope. Can you see that this is not a single dislocation, but it's a pair of dislocations? So in order to enter the gamma prime, you must have two dislocations on the right slip plane, the right orientation, moving through the gamma prime. All that makes deformation difficult. Okay? What I'd like you to think about is can we create something like this for steel? Can you find a precipitate which will be coherent with the matrix, almost the same lattice parameter? So that is uh, a part of the assignment which you will get tomorrow. Okay? I want you to think about how to create a system like this for steel. I may not know the answer, yeah? so I'm looking forward to seeing your answers. Okay, uh, I'm going to now uh, talk more about symmetry. And in the last lecture, I talked about various kinds of rotation axes. So a dyad is a rotation of 180 degrees uh, about the axis, which reproduces. So this is supposed to be a square there. Uh, 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 sorry, a rectangle. So if I rotate by 180 degrees, I reproduce the rectangle. Triad is a threefold axis of rotation. That means by 120 degrees to reproduce the object. Tetrad, this is a square, 90 degree rotations. And hexad is a six-fold axis of rotation. Now, is there anything missing there? Hmm? Five-fold. Yeah? There's no five-fold axis, rotation axis of symmetry, because when you have something that has long range order, there is no five-fold rotation which will reproduce uh, the pattern. Okay? It's impossible. Has anybody got any comments on that? A recent Nobel Prize? Mm -hmm. Quasar crystals. So if you took a diffraction pattern from a quasar crystal, so called quasar crystal, you could get a tenfold or a five fold rotation. But why is it called quasi crystal? Yeah, so it, you cannot have five-fold symmetry with long-range order. So you have to imagine a quasi-crystal as consisting of two different unit cells which are stacked. They call it tessellation. All right? So to produce those patterns, you need to have two different unit cells stacked together. Okay? Right, so uh, summarizing again, um, we had uh, a rotation axis, but we can also combine with uh, translations to produce the screw diode, which is 180 degree rotation, and a translation, which is a fraction of the lattice vector. In this case, it's half, because this is the lattice vector, 
we <coughs> rotate by 180 degrees, translate by half that. And similarly, in the glide plane, you reflect and then you translate. Okay. Now, uh, this is a molecule of water, yeah, H2O, and it's bent, it's bent, right? And this is why you know uh, ice is less dense than water. Yeah. Now, if this molecule was straight then ice would be heavier than water and what would be the consequence of that to civilization as we know it? Any ideas? The ice would sink, right? So the oceans would eventually freeze completely. So you have to thank a bent molecule of water for the existence of life on Earth. So, you know, in the first lecture you learned, um, what did we learn which was really important? It was something about, uh, yeah, the magnetism of iron, which gives you the BCC structure, without which we wouldn't have civilization as we know it. Now, you owe civilization to the fact that the water molecule is bent, okay? And if I look at the symmetry of that water molecule, then I've got a two-fold axis going through there. You know, if I rotate by 180 degrees, the uh, hydrogen atom moves from there to the next hydrogen atom, right? And similarly, I've got a mirror plane here reflecting this to this, right? So the notation that I use to express the symmetry of all the symmetry elements passing through this point is a dyad and a mirror plane parallel to that dyad. So you can see this mirror plane is parallel to that dyad, okay? So we say that the point group symmetry of this molecule is 2m. All the symmetry elements passing through a single point in the middle is the dyad and the mirror plane parallel to that dyad. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? What is the use of doing this, right? So supposing there's another molecule, uh, say sulfur tetrafluoride, which has the same point group symmetry then the vibration modes of that molecule will be similar. Okay? How do we detect vibration modes? Is there any chemist here? Chemical engineer? Any scientist? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what is the method by which we detect uh, vibration modes? So how do we know that you know, a star far away has hydrogen? What's the method by which we can do? We can look at the light coming from a far, far galaxy far away, yeah, and decide that it consists of these elements. Hmm? Yeah, so spectroscopy, right? And spectroscopy, the frequencies that we detect depend on the vibration modes. So if there is another molecule which has the same point group symmetry, then you should find at least the same lines in the spectrum, okay? Obviously, you know, the frequency might be different because the masses of the elements might be different, but those lines should be present, okay? So that is one use of point group symmetry. Uh, these are the vibration modes of the water molecule, uh, and sulfur tetrafluoride has actually got the same point group symmetry. Here is the molecule. Okay, so we've got a dyad passing there and a mirror plane this way. Can you see that? Yeah, so it's a 2M point group symmetry. Now, because we've got four atoms, you may have additional vibration modes, but those basic vibration modes present in the water molecule will also be present in the sulfur tetrafluoride and therefore you will pick up similar lines in the spectrum, okay? Everyone happy with that? So that's the first application of symmetry that you've seen. Okay, now this is uh, how crystallography was done. Absolutely brilliant work without any diffraction, all right? 
without any uh, in complicated instrumentation apart from devices to measure angles and so forth. And this, this is a crystal of gypsum. It looks like this. Uh, can you find some symmetry elements for me? Yeah, where, where is the mirror plane? This is the... Uh, along parallel to the piece. Correct, yeah. So par parallel to the edge, edges here. Okay, what, what else? Sorry? Yeah, where is that? Yeah. So let, let me now go to the movie so that you can see that a uh, little bit more clearly. Okay, so you can see there's a, a two-fold axis about which I rotated that image, yeah, and the mirror plane along the edge, yeah. Right now, in this case, um, the two-fold axis is at 90 degrees to the mirror plane, right? Yeah? Two-fold axis is normal to the plane of the crystal, and the mirror plane is there. So instead of writing 2m, you would write 2 upon m. So the point group symbol for this crystal is 2 upon m. Now, again, what is the use of this information? Well, remember that we don't have uh, X-ray diffraction or anything. We are about 100 years behind the times. Okay, uh, I will... Uh, now, if you look at this table, what do you think is the structure of gypsum? Monoclinic, yeah? So you can see from the shape of the crystal that it has a symmetry 2 upon m, and therefore it's monoclinic, okay? So this is how, how they used to solve for structures, by looking at the equilibrium shape of the crystal, yeah? It's got a symmetry 2 upon m, and there's no 2 upon m in any of the other crystal classes. Now, this is a, uh, another, another, a little bit more complicated shape. Uh, so, you've got 111 faces here, and then another pair of 111 faces, but uh, the other direction and 110 and 1 bar 10. And these two faces are not at 90 degrees. They are at approximately 89 degrees. Okay. So um, it's difficult, but can you tell me some symmetry elements? Yeah, which axis? What kind of axis? Dyad, yes. There's a dyad going vertically. Is there any uh, any other rotation axis? See, there's no dyad going through here because these faces are not at 90 degrees. But through the corner, there's a dyad, and through the other corner, there's a dyad. So I'll show you a movie. First of all, uh, for the vertical diet. So if I rotate by uh, 180 degrees, I'll reproduce the original orientation. Okay. Okay, so there is a diet vertical. The <laughs> See what I mean by technology? Right. 
Right, so this is now the epsomite crystal, but we are rotating about an axis going through the edge, through, through this edge, okay? And you'll see that after we've done by 180 degrees, you'll reproduce the original shape. Okay, so before and after rotation. You can see the colors are here different, yeah? Okay. So I produced this movie with Google SketchUp, in case you're interested, okay? Right, so there's a, a vertical dyad and two dyads at 90 degrees. So what would be the symmetry, point group symmetry? Just take a guess. Just write the elements, two, 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 okay? Two to two, you've got that, yeah. And what would be the structure? Orthorhombic. Orthorhombic means that all the angles are 90 degrees, but the edges of the cell are all different, right? Now, these point group symbols, they have some conventions. So I've already explained to you one convention that here the vertical axis is at 90 degrees to the mirror plane, so we write 2 upon m. This is a, a dyad, and there are two mirror planes parallel to it. So you could write it as mm2, right? Or just as 2m, because if you have 2m, then you generate the third mirror plane, or as mm, yeah? So it isn't something that you should remember. There are tables of point groups that you can use and I've given you a, a version of that table. Here you are. So this, for example, means there's a tetrad at 90 degrees to a mirror plane, <coughs> right? And then there are two mirror planes parallel to that. So really, that should be written as 4 upon m, m, m. But crystallographers like to have conventions. So when it's written, when, when instead of doing this, you just write it all in a row and assume that only that mirror plane is at 90 degrees. Well, it, it makes sense because you can't have two mirror planes at 90 degrees to the same axis, right? Okay. Um, bar 4 means that you have a fourfold axis of rotation and a center of symmetry. So you invert. So you go through 90 degrees and then you invert through the middle of the crystal. So there's no need for you to think very hard about these, but these are the point group symbols that are used conventionally. But you can see that there's real applications of the point group symmetries. By looking at the object, you can decide what point group it is, and therefore what crystal class it should depend on. So even if you look in a transmission electron microscope, <coughs> and assuming that your structure is not far from equilibrium, you have a particular shape <clears throat> that must be consistent with the symmetry of that crystal and the symmetry of the matrix in which it is. <clears throat> now, I'll just tell you one more convention, is that when we write these symbols, the first one should be parallel to the z-axis, and then you have two axes at 90 degrees to that axis, okay? That's the normal convention. But in a cube, the triad is extremely important as a symmetry element, yeah? It's a defining symmetry. So in a cube, there's an anomaly that we start with the tetrad along the z-axis, then we have the triad, which is not at 90 degrees to the z, and then we have a, a dyad. Okay, But in general, this will be parallel to z, and these two are at 90 degrees to the z-axis. And of course, you can find many, many symmetry elements sometimes, but you don't need them all, because once you have these three, all the others are generated automatically. So I don't need to write 4 upon m, m, 2, 3, blah, blah. I just write the minimum that's necessary to completely define the problem. Okay. 
Okay, I, I, I think this is a good point to stop, and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>